Oops, cool. <laughs> well, hi, everybody. Um, thank you guys for coming. My name is Leah Palmer, as we've seen. I'm a postgrad at the Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage in the Technical Studies Lab. Um, so some of y'all, or a lot of postgrads just in general, are studying kind of medicine, maybe to become a doctor. And I studied art history in college, so that is not where I am going to end up. But I will say that I kind of consider myself an aspiring art doctor. So what does that mean? Um, so I am trying to become an art conservator. So what is art conservation? So art conservation encompasses all of the actions taken towards preserving and stabilizing cultural heritage, like art, historical artifacts, archeological items, so that they last for future generations. And this can involve conservation treatment, which is where a conservator actually like puts hands on an object and modifies it in some way to make sure it remains stable for the future. It can become more structurally sound. Um, so for example, in my past few internships, I've undertaken conservation treatments like stitching a tear in Abraham Lincoln's assassination box and consolidating flaking paint on a Vietnam veteran's memorial banner. Conservation also involves preventive conservation, which is where a conservator would like modify um, and monitor the environment around an object. So for example, while working for the National Park Service, I created a like storage and display mount for an object uh, to reduce occurrences of object handling and potential object damage. And then here I'm monitoring the pests in collection spaces to make sure there's not an infestation of insects that could potentially like eat the, the objects themselves. Lastly, art conservation involves conservation science, which is where analytical techniques are used to investigate the materiality of objects, like what those art objects are actually made out of. So here you can see me using a variety of instruments to analyze historical artifacts, some of which I'll get into in a moment. So I'm gonna be starting a master's program in art conservation soon to become a conservator. And the job of the conservator is mostly comprised of these two areas on the right. They're comprised of conservation treatments and preventive conservation. So while conservation conservators are like trained in conservation science, the people who are actually experts in this field are conservation scientists. And they're the ones who are experts in using their scientific knowledge and analytical skills to learn more about an object's chemical makeup and therefore inform the activities of conservation in their treatment and care for objects. So conservation science is what I've been doing at the Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage. And this institute, which lives on West Campus, is comprised of three different labs. The Lens Media Lab, which is focused on the materials involved in black and white photography. The International Programs Area, which helps support cultural heritage preservation abroad. And then the Technical Studies Lab, where I work. So I work primarily under the supervision of three chemists who all have a special focus in using their chemistry knowledge on cultural heritage items. So in the technical studies lab, we seek to understand the chemical makeup of historical objects. And this knowledge, as we said, can be put to use by conservators working on those objects and historians looking to learn more about the object's history, authenticity, or provenance. Our lab has actually had a hand in identifying misleading or even fake artworks, which we can talk about. You can ask me about if you're curious. The Technical Studies Lab is equipped with a wide variety of instrumentation, some of which y'all may be familiar with because they're commonly used in a variety of lab environments. Kind of as an aside, if you are familiar with these techniques, you'll see that a lot of them are um, non-destructive analytical techniques, meaning that we don't have to remove a piece of the artwork in order to actually characterize its materiality. This is like very key in the conservation world because we're trying to do everything we can to avoid damaging the artwork. Um, so if small samples do need to be taken, um, some of these techniques are micro-destructive, meaning they only require a very small amount of the artwork in order to be informative. So Today, I'd like to briefly discuss two case studies that kind of emblemize the type of research questions that we investigate, the type of analytical work that we do, and how that work gets put to use in the wider art community. And I want to specifically focus on these three techniques, macro x-ray fluorescence, technical imaging, and Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. So Yale University Art Gallery has in its collection several carved panels or reliefs taken from the Assyrian palace of Ashurnasirpal II, which was built in the 850s BCE. 
and the reliefs have recently been under technical analysis for a very interesting reason. As you can see in this image, this is like a blank alabaster carving, but it didn't always look like this. It's well known due to writings from archaeologists first uncovering these reliefs that the stone carvings used to be actually very brightly painted with a variety of pigments. But what's less known is exactly what colors these reliefs would have been painted. So the Peabody Museum is hoping to display these reliefs in their new renovated space shining colored lights onto the reliefs to help museum goers get a better understanding of like what they used to look like. So where does the technical studies lab come in? Well, the historians and curators working on this project want to get a more accurate idea of exactly what kind of pigments were used, as well as more information about maybe historical conservation treatments that have gone down. So the technical studies lab has utilized a variety of instruments to analyze these works to gather color and composition information. So the first instrument is macroextillate fluorescence. So when we're wanting to look for evidence of historical pigments that include things like mercury, iron, arsenic, other heavy metals, the TS Technical Studies Lab turns to macroextillate fluorescence, macroxrf, and this is a large area scanning instrument that provides elemental analysis for primarily inorganic materials. This instrument generates x-rays, exciting the atoms in an object, causing it to eject electrons that live near the nucleus, and in order to stabilize the atom, higher energy electrons from a higher shell will jump down into the vacancies left, and the excess energy that they contain will be emitted as fluorescent photons. Since the orbital structure of each element is unique, these photons that are emitted are also unique. So the detector of the XRF measures the very specific energy of the fluorescence, resulting in a spectrum with peaks at different locations that correspond to the fluorescence energies of the elements present, as well as a false color map of the object in question. So as an example, this is a false color map of the presence of iron on one of the Assyrian reliefs. As you can see, there's traces of iron throughout the relief. Um, and this particular map doesn't give us very helpful information about pigments because iron is often present in dirt or fill materials, all of which seem to have been smeared into the grooves in this carving. But Technical Studies Lab did make some interesting discoveries on very close investigation into small sections of the relief. For example, in this area, in one of the figures curls, if you look super closely, you can see like teeny tiny specks of brighter areas where the little arrows are on these false color maps. Um, and these dots are like almost microscopic particles of mercury and gold respectively. And the presence of mercury and gold were also confirmed in the spectral data taken at each particular spot. You can see the distinctive mercury peak and then a sharp peak of gold. And as both mercury and gold are unlikely to be found in like fill materials, it's a good guess that both of these particles are trace elements of pigments that used to be present. So gold was most likely present as gold paint, but mercury probably would have been present as cinnabar of really deep red color. Cinnabar or mercuric sulfide occurs naturally as a red ore and is present in a lot of artworks across the years as vermilion, a pigment. So while we need more evidence to like confirm that the presence of vermilion and gold, identifying these small particles allows us to tentatively hypothesize the presence of gold and red pigments on these reliefs. One of my contributions to this project has been analyzing the elemental maps produced by MacroXRF, subtracting off some of the elements that may be distracting and producing element specific maps that can give us more information about pigments. Um, for example, here's a map of copper um, that and then a map of copper that co-occurs with zinc subtracted out of it. So because the energies of copper and zinc overlap a, bit, a little bit, the elemental maps can sometimes be misleading. And the one on this side is probably a lot more accurate of a picture of the presence of copper. And this is important because copper is a key component of Egyptian blue, a copper calcium silicate, which was one of the earliest synthetic pigments and would have most likely be used to create the blue pigments that might have been present on these reliefs. So we still have like a long ways to go in attempting to figure out the types of pigments on these reliefs, but I hope you can see how like useful these analytical techniques are in squeezing out information from something that seems at first glance pretty uninformative, like those blank reliefs. The, the second case study I'd like to briefly discuss is a project on Indian yellow led by British Art Center paper conservator Anita Day. And this project focuses on the use of 
European and Indian artistic materials in the works of artists employed by the British East India Company, with a particular emphasis on Indian yellow pigments in watercolor artworks. So Indian yellow was made out of the urine of cows fed only with mango leaves. And it is now no longer manufactured because that manufacturer is like highly unethical. So in looking at artistic materials used, the technical studies lab was asked to analyze Indian yellow samples with a variety of different instruments to help understand what this pigment looks like under various analysis techniques, particularly when layered with other pigments that would have been used at the time. So one technique used was technical imaging. The first step in this process was to create swatches of authentic Indian yellow watercolor, imitation yellow Indian watercolor, and other similar pigments in combination with a variety of other like time period relevant pigments. After creating these, I helped perform technical imaging of these paint outs, which involves irradiating a sample like this with multiple different wavelengths of light, including those pictured here, and seeing how the material fluoresce or luminesce. Each compound can luminesce or fluoresce slightly differently, so this type of imaging can be like a helpful supplementary technique in identifying different pigments. Another technique we're using to try and characterize Indian yellow is Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, or FTIR. So FTIR shines infrared light onto your object, modifying the vibrational energy in the molecule's bonds. And because different bonds and functional groups absorb the IR radiation at different frequencies, the transmit its pattern, the transmit its or um, reflectance patterns that result from IR radiation can tell us a lot about the molecules in the object in question. So currently I'm gathering spectra from this particular Indian yellow paint out in the corner in order to see if we get very distinctive or differentiable peaks from the authentic Indian yellow and then the two other imitation Indian yellows. So we're trying to see if FTIR is a viable option for confirming or disproving the presence of Indian yellow on art objects. Um, this project is also still ongoing, but we are learning about the most useful and accurate ways to identify Indian yellow in historical artworks. So to conclude, these two case studies show just a few of the many types of analyses that we perform at TSL when examining and asking questions about objects. And as you can see, we like strive to use non-destructive techniques that gather as much information as possible with as little damage to the artworks as possible. And personally, while at TSL, I feel like I've just learned how much information exists in an artwork's chemical makeup. And this information can be so useful in communicating about this artwork's state of origin, its conservation history, and much more. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the members of my lab and the wider Yale community who have led these projects and who've like taken a lot of pictures included in this presentation. And thank you guys so much for listening and being here. Um, yes, the end. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. So I know this is a really small. Um, my question wasn't about the talk, but rather you said you did artistry and you call it like this group fairly technical. Mm -hmm. Going into your master's, are you interested in creating about the chemistry and you know like uh like how the chemistry? Yeah. Uh, no, that's a great question. Um, so in becoming a conservator, there's a lot of Court prerequisite coursework um, in order to get into grad school. Mm -hmm. And some of that coursework involves chemistry. So I took up through Orgo too, um, and it wasn't my strongest suit, um, but we do have a, a chemist, uh, conservation scientist here, my friend Monica, who majored in chemistry, and she is trying to become one of these chemists who specialize in cultural heritage, whereas I am trying to become <laughs> a conservator who specializes in like taking care of artworks. While in grad school, I will have like chemistry classes, but it's gonna be a lot more about kind of analytical techniques, like very boots on the ground rather than like theoretical. Um, so I'll keep learning more about that, uh, but truly <laughs> chemistry is not like my strongest suit, but it's been really great to kind of like beef up that while here. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? You had mentioned earlier about how you maybe in like scenes and big paintings. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know what the process is like, like how do you get 
Yeah, so this is actually like a huge deal for the technical studies lab, but if you Google the Vinland map, um, we did a lot of work on that like project. So this map kind of briefly was thought to be like a quite old original map from like, I don't even know, 1400s, 1500s. Um, and it was it was put onto like original parchment. So that felt very real. Um, but in analyzing with macro XRF and other techniques, we saw that, or one of my supervisors saw that one of the inks used, titanium white, wouldn't have been invented until early 1900s, late 1800s, unclear. So just things like that, where you have like a date of origin of some of these materials, and you can like definitively say like, no, this has to be fake because this wasn't even invented when this was purported to have been created. So that's one of the things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think first, I I knew that chemistry was not my strong suit, but it is like um, something that is used in the field. But then second, I feel like while being here, I've understood just how powerful some of these techniques can be. Um, and while many institutions don't have as broad a range of analytical techniques as Yale, there will be some that have them. So if I, as a conservator, go and work in like a museum like the Met, um, I want to be aware of the fact that like I can ask questions about like what these things are made of, what what would be a dangerous thing to use as a conservator versus what would be safer. Um, so I think it's been really helpful to be here to understand like there are so many questions I can ask and so many opportunities to answer those questions if I just know about them. I think just having the having the awareness has been really helpful if that answers your question. Any more questions? Clarification. Um, I think you mentioned that as a contributor, did you also be part of the restoring process? Or it's just like, I guess the thing that's are mm. I don't know the word. Yeah. You mentioned light as mm -hmm. light. One often, so that's without actually painting it at all, but it's just yes. a display way to show what it would look like. Yes, 100%. Yeah. So, conservation and restoration are like two quite, or they're like people use them interchangeably, but they're actually quite different. Restoration's goal is to make something look like it used to, right as it was like fresh out of the artist's workshop. Conservation, however, is taking into account like the historical degradation that's happened while still making sure that like the object itself isn't going to fall apart um so there are like really interesting like compensatory or like restoration techniques like light um that have been used like a while back there was a set of painted murals by mark rothko that the paint had faded um so using like analyses people figured out what colors they needed to project onto the painting to make it look a bit more like it used to um but that doesn't involve touching the object at all um and that's like one of the key tenets like i said of conservation is you don't want to hurt it like at all so restoration often does hurt an object whereas conservation like tries not to it's also done with like much larger scale, I guess it's hard to like more like monuments. Ooh, yeah, no, that's very fair. I know that there was a conversation about one of the um like Civil War uh general statues that had um graffiti on it from like the 2020 protests, and the graffiti had been cleaned off, but there's still records of what was on there. So people have like contemplated what if we shine lights like that recreate the graffiti because that was also very important and historical. Um so yeah, like monuments, that's it's a great idea. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.